So without further ado, I'd like to invite the next three uh, speakers. Uh, they're just going to sit here and have a conversation uh, with one another and with all of us. Um, I would like to invite uh, Adam Gettings from Leo. Adam spoke with yesterday. He's uh, a technologist, uh, inventor, entrepreneur, uh, likes to build things, solve problems, and think 50 years ahead. Um, I'd like to invite Brian Monahan, uh, uh, co-founder at Kiwi Connect as well. Uh, great friend, great brother. Um, I'm 20 days older than him. That's my uh, <laughs> fame to come. Yeah. Um, and uh, Eben Pagan as well, um, who's been a, a good friend uh, and a mentor to many of us here. Please welcome to the stage. Excellent. So yeah, as, as Yosef mentioned, really just kind of looking to have a, a conversation here and, uh, and keep it free, free flowing and fluid. Yeah, spot the inflection, what, what? Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've known both you guys for a while and uh, one of the things that I've always enjoyed about our conversations, I think all three of us take a very sort of meta uh, view of the world, very sort of abstract thinking and uh, that can really help, you know, in sort of today's theme of investment the ability to kind of anticipate uh, what's happening and, and abstract trends and um, themes uh, can really help in the allocation of capital can, in time. So I was hoping that uh, each of you, and, and I'll chime in as well, could talk about maybe the, the one to three trends that you see going on in the world today that are going to have the most significant impact over the next, let's say, 10 years as an investment window. If either of you have some <laughs> things that jump out there. Um, okay. Robotics. Is it, is it, well, I'll talk about something totally unrelated to robotics, actually. Let's start there. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a trend in, this is kind of specific to U.S., but it, we can relate it to NZ. Um, there's a trend in Americana and craftsmanship uh, in products in the U.S. and companies. A lot of old companies are coming out of the woodwork and... Um, brands that meant a lot, um, say 100 years ago or 150 years ago, um, are being rediscovered and, and revitalized. And um, there's this export of, of American craftsman culture that's going to Asia. That's a big trend that I see. Um, and um, that's something that um, is interesting, certainly interesting. If you look at, maybe if you go back, the export of European culture to the U.S., um, 100 years before, 150 years before, we're seeing, seeing something similar in Asia with the export of uh, U.S. culture and U.S. historical uh, companies are in the areas of, it, the story of, the, of work, work actually is interesting. So. And, and how are you seeing that affected from the, um, we'll call it changing geopolitical scene? You know, there's obviously been a lot going on sort of globally uh, of changing relationships between governments. Is, are you still you know, I know through Red Wing and, and the like, um, has that affected sort of the population's interest in, in these themes or are those kind of separate issues you see? Well, I, I certainly think that China has come online in the last 50 years and they're, um, they're trying to create a culture, or build a culture, have a sense of purpose. And uh, they're pulling that from the U.S.'s culture around capitalism, consumption, products, and, and, um, and I think that's, that's something that they're looking they're looking at and absorbing, and it's so it's almost like the the fifties in China right now, um, which is in some ways really scary and in some ways um, kind of exciting. So, yeah, if that answers your question, I don't know. Evan, you got any thoughts on trends? Yeah, thanks for giving me the few minutes to think of them. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for going first. Um, so let's see, I'll, I'll do three. Um, first one is design. Um, so we're moving into a and envision it and create it reality more. We don't, most of us don't notice that the environments that we live most of our lives in are essentially entirely human created and designed. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, even, even here, very close to nature, this is a somewhat terraformed environment even. Um, you know, hopefully we're gonna evolve to, I mean, you know, these guys obviously, but hopefully all of us will evolve to be more uh, gardeners than 
terraformers, you know, will uh, get into harmony with the land. Uh, but as we move more into this uh, this entrepreneurial future, developing the ability to see things, imagine them differently, and then go and create what you imagine in your mind, this artistic ability is becoming much more important. Um, and I, I tend to think that we're moving into essentially a second renaissance right now in terms of art and creativity and the ability to and design up here and then go create out there and then design up here and go create out there. So studying design, I think, is very important. I was going to riff on that a little bit. Riff? Um, and uh, I think this, the modern renaissance is uh, it's tied to the cost of design, the cost of the tools necessary to do design, and the cost of sharing and, and collaborating with people, communication, essentially. And that those are all going down dramatically. And that's contributing to that. And, and just sort of specifically, one one thing that jumps out of me is is all these new tools like CNC routers and laser cutters and 3D printers, and you know, is a very specific area for sort of investment opportunity. You know, it's one thing that we're going to be doing a lot of here on the farm. We invested in like some big 3D printers and stuff to be able to create um, that that design very cheaply, whereas before, you know, that would cost millions to do what now can be done for thousands. Do you want a story? A quick story. Uh, so when we started the, the robot business, we were selling to police initially who needed a way to go into crack houses where they knew somebody had a gun. They needed to be able to go in there remotely and check it out before um, they did anything else because the current protocol was, you know, it was send in a, 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 a flashbang, bars down, uh, bang down the door, run inside and start shooting. And so um, we had to come up with something to test with, with a team of four. And uh, what we did first was we used 3D printing, 3D printing technology. I designed these things in CAD, these products in CAD, and literally printed them off and had an artist paint them so they looked real. <laughs> and then we went and showed them to customers. <laughs> and we said, hey, what do you think about this? And we, we tried so many. If you come to our office ever, you'll see that we had you know, a dozen different variations of these designs that, um, that the customers, potential customers thought were real. And, um, and that gave us tremendous credibility and it helped us guide the path for how we built the solution event that we eventually got to. But um, how, we, you know, that, that, the parts for those were you know, purchased on the internet, designed CAD files with software that was practically free, send, send the, the software files off to our partner in, across the country, you know, they printed the parts off, mailed it to us, and then we had somebody paint it. And it was, that, just, that couldn't have been done 20 years ago. Yeah, I also, uh, I think all, every one of us is creative. We're all just incredibly creative. And so I think that getting in touch with whatever part of you um, is artistically creative, whether it's musical, whether it's dance, whether it's visual art, and even if it's been 10 or 20 or 30 years or something, get back into it. You know, keep, keep developing that side. Um, we've been become very interested in art over the last several years we've started collecting art and yeah so I, I think it's gonna be a big deal uh, so design um, you want me to keep going okay second one would be entrepreneurship um, and so my formula for entrepreneurship I'm gonna just give you a piece of it um, and I I give this just as uh, some threads to you know run down or some areas to study so the inner game of entrepreneurship I think is about learning creativity, productivity, and leadership. Um, creativity, um, studying the process of creating new things by making new combinations, and systematically recombining all of the different elements that you have to create new possibilities. Whether it be with food or with music, or it's one of the reasons why art is so great is because you can learn three different dance moves and then learn how to do them, start putting them together, and immediately be creative. Or with music, you can sit down at a piano and you can learn three notes, and you know there's six ways that you can put those three notes together in sequence. You can immediately start seeing the combinations. So creativity, uh, productivity, um, which I define as getting what you want, getting the result that you wanted. So practice imagining an outcome that you want and then go out into the world and create it and regularly review and see whether or not you actually achieved it and also um, develop the ability to create new habits. Um, that's kind of the meta productivity skill of the future is learn the skill of grooving new habits. It takes about 30 days. You want to do the same ritual every day at the same time for 30 days. 
best way to use your willpower. And then uh, leadership, which is a simplified way of um, defining leadership, would be helping other people develop their creativity and their productivity. Because when someone shows up into a different social setting or a different business setting, and there's another person there that's helping them be more creative and them be more productive, that's the, that's the leader. That's who they want to hang out with. Um, especially as we move into a more entrepreneurial kind of world. So that would be the inner game of entrepreneurship, which I'm very passionate about. And there's a lot more you can talk to me about afterwards if uh, you want to talk about the outer game. What's the, what's the third trend? Uh, third one I came up with is um, futurism, mm. which is kind of like a meta trend. Um, it's, my, uh, it's my view after you know, studying futurism for a while that a few decades ago, 30, 40 years ago, people like Alvin and Heidi Toffler came out with Future Shock, and you've got John Nesbitt with Megatrends, and you've got some of these other you know, futurists. Futurist is a new thing that's on the scene, and there are really only a handful of them even now that are famous and well-known for being futurists, people like Ray Kurzweil and, and so forth. Um, I think that we're going to quickly realize that being a futurist isn't optional anymore that we all need to be watching the main trends that are emerging in key areas like technology and education and the environment and sustainability and things, and watching what's happening and watching the, the news in each of these areas so that we can see where they're going. Um, just one of the you know, questions I, I keep asking, like where, how's that going to impact reality in the next three to five years? Because we need to be looking out into the future and making decisions about career choices, the skills that we're learning, the relationships that we're setting up, based on where we're going to be in the future, so that we're forward compatible. So that when we wake up in the future, the new skill that we learned is more valuable, because I, th I think, unfortunately, most of the skills that most people are learning, they're going to wake up in five or 10 years, and they're going to realize that it's like, that was a waste of time. You're just sort of riffing on that of, as we sort of look out and sort of forecast, like what skills do we want, anticipating exponential change, you know, and, and this is something that you, we've talked a lot about and sort of for everybody, like, you know, exponential change just being like, you know, the X squared on the graph, nonlinear, you know, going up in a compounding interest sort of fashion. And, um, you know, Ray Kurzweil uh, and, and many others have sort of extrapolated on the the nature of exponential technology change you know you, you the usb thumb disks you know you might be able to use to get you know uh, five megabytes for sixty dollars and now they're two terabytes and they're like free as you know product promos and uh, yeah exactly and, and these things are you know there's more and more of that happening all the time and um, computing processing etc and so what effect that has on our culture and what skills are required um, so I just kind of wanted to throw that out of anticipating exponential change in our society uh, as sort of this trend that we think about a lot because it's very non-intuitive uh, to come back to your point yesterday, what that actually looks like in, in 50 years or, or even in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just a couple of thoughts. I, I think uh, going back, to, I wish Scott was here, um, but Scott Nolan yesterday was talking about um, the the investment patterns of VC and how they're looking for, uh, they're looking for those thousand X returns. And I think that's an interesting thing to consider in an exponential, um, exponentially expanding world or, or, or changing world. Um, it'll be those, those edge cases that have the tremendous return, those, those, those few that are doing some particular skill now that, that they can't even predict is going to end up being a thousand times more valuable in the future. Those are going to be the people that do control the future. And it's, hard, it's, it's really hard to predict who they're going to be right now. Yeah, we, we have to pay attention to these things. Um, you know, it used to be a vacuum tube, and then it became a little transistor. And I was just reading that they now put two billion of them in the space the size of a period, right, in a chip. Yeah. That's, it's impossible to conceive, you know, as and in, in what that, what, you know, what's going on in there even. I was, I was just reading the other day that um, the, even the tools, the technology tools and the algorithms that they use to design the next generation of processors, the scientists no longer even understand them because a lot of it is algorithms that the computer figured out. Mm. And so the, the, 
the tools that we're using to design the next generation of these things, we don't even fully comprehend anymore. Um, the <clears throat> what comes in our current model of iPad, the processing power in there, um, was in 1985 the fastest computer in the world, the Cray supercomputer. And in 1995 was still one of the top 500 fastest computers in the world. And now it comes in your iPad that you get for a, a few hundred bucks. Um, and that isn't stopping. That's continuing to go. Um, and I, I, there's some, has anyone noticed that like right now it, something important is happening? Like when you talk into your mobile and it can hear what you're saying real time and it's typing it and then it goes back and it corrects a word real <laughs> while you're talking yep. and there's just there's something going on like we're just crossing a, a key threshold right now and I think we just have to pay attention to the hardware the software the capabilities and what these things will do because these exponential curves we're also seeing opportunity is the like the most condensed that it's ever been the, the hyper growth, when you get involved in one of these good ideas or one of these great businesses, they can grow faster than they've ever been able to grow and scale before. So that's very exciting. So the, like the power structure of the world, gonna, it, it's going to be unpredictable because of that. Mm. Because people will be employing these technologies in, in a wide subset of, um, of um, a, a, wide, a wide range of ways. And, and a few of those will end up becoming really, really important in the future. And we don't know which ones. Yeah. Sort of, you talk about the power structure, and, and you know we've seen a lot of shifts now happening in the global you know world from like Egypt and the the overthrow or, or of Hosni Mubarak, and um, you know these these ways in which you know which was largely attributed to to things like Twitter uh, helping mobilize you know mass uh, social movements. I'm curious, just now as we sort of zoom back, okay, the technology's gotten so ahead of the game that we can't even understand it anymore. Um, what are things that we might do in our culture to be well adapted to these changing environments? Like, you know, I mean, I know that both of you uh, have young children. I'd be curious if, are there any things that you're doing in thinking in parenthood about how to raise your kids in this sort of exponentially changing world? and things that maybe other folks could learn in, in a broader lesson for our culture? I haven't thought about it yet, to be honest. It's only been three months, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> you're making me nervous now. <laughs> I'll take that one. Yeah, cool. I've had 23 months, so... <laughs> <laughs> I got, what, 20 months on you now? Um, So a few things. Um, one of them is um, living in harmony with your environment, whatever it is. Mm. And so there's, you know, here what there are a lot of ex experiments and a lot of um, a lot of resources and a lot of uh, heart and mind being put into how do we live in harmony with the planet and the life around us. It's a, a very kind of physical mm. approach. There's also how to live in harmony with other human beings in a in relationship, you know. So that'd be like a, a more of an emotional side, and then how to live in harmony with other people conceptually and mentally. Um, it's it's one of my favorite Rubik's cubes it, uh, to just look at. Is it, it's so weird to me that those that are involved in causes can't seem to align with each other, and no matter how hard they try, it seems like it just they just can't get into harmony in some way. And so our, um, our natural, see I'm calling it natural, or our, maybe I'll call it our tendency um, to look at where we're different mentally or conceptually instead of starting out and saying, what are, what are the values you have that are the same as mine? And then let's build a relationship based on those rather than get caught up in you know, arguments and waste a bunch of energy in the areas where we're not aligned. Um, so living in alignment, I think, is a really, uh, really important one. Um, another one is, I guess, the basis for learning and creativity, which is pattern, pattern recognition and pattern creation, essentially. And so I think a lot about that with my child, uh, helping her. And I help her, you know, as often as I can, recognize patterns of similarity and patterns of difference and then combinations of, of those things. Yeah, so alignment with place and people as well as the ability to synthesize and identify patterns as kind of core skills in this new era. It's cool. Um, you know, you talk about alignment, that, that sort of brings up 
this theme that we've we've talked around a lot around sort of this concept of incubation nation uh, and the opportunity for New Zealand to really lead the world in uh, prototyping and developing new solutions for global uh, problems and you know within that one thing that that we see a lot is is that there is sort of culturally already more of a tendency to see the commonalities instead of the differences and sort of uh, raised in America you know the individualism is really really strong and um, you know that that to me is one of the most exciting things about New Zealand is there is that sort of uh, identify identity that we're all in it together and that's obviously true locally as well as, as globally as we face these global challenges I'm wondering if, if either of you could just kind of riff on oh, what might be some of the opportunities and some of the advantages uh, as well as maybe disadvantages that exist for New Zealand investment as these sort of big trends play out and play through you know I, I sort of mentioned the alignment I also think that um, location is is really critical the I think that um, through the internet and telecommunications the distance that traditionally was a huge barrier for New Zealand is no longer as relevant as it used to be through things like Skype. You know, now you can have a face-to-face, -face, high resolution conversation with anyone in the world, whereas, you know, 25 years ago that was, you know, impossible. And, you know, 75 years ago it was like put a letter on the on the ship and it was like a, a very, very, you know, distant uh, proposition. Um, so thinking about, you know, alignment, proximity, is there anything else that comes up for you guys as, as themes that might be relevant for New Zealand investment? Oh, okay. Um, well, this is an island nation, and so as an island nation, you, you do have to um, consider um, alignment with your neighbors. Um, and, and the world is an island as well, uh, but people just can't, they can't see their neighbors and understand those relationships yet. So this, uh, the potential here is, um, if it, I'm not sure when the timing is, but at some point it's going to be critical that we do align as a world. And, uh, and so, you know, New Zealand's ahead of the game in that, case, in that, in that arena. Yeah, I'm, um, really impressed by the, the integration of the two cultures here mm. and how much the government leaders, I mean, basically unanimously really get it. Like you can just feel it. Um, and so that, whatever the learnings are around that, um, that's something that, you know, for my daughter, I want her to be a multicultural, like natively person. And so we plan to have her visit, you know, several different world cultures as she's growing up. Um, I haven't seen that anywhere. It sure seems like whatever the code is that they've figured out for that. I mean, and when you model humans, when you, you know, model their beliefs and their processes and their strategies and the sequences of how they do things, um, what you basically find unanimously is that the real experts are not conscious of what they're doing. Mm. So you have to go in and you have to get experts to model their belief sets and their strategies and what they do. But going in and figuring out how the leaders here do that, what the code of that is, and then packaging that up and bringing it out to the world so that they could use that whenever they're moving in. I mean, I'll bet you that that, that knowledge, that kind of IP would be super valuable, whether it be you know, a merger of two companies and dealing with the culture there all the way to borders to, you know, where there's, you know, huge influx immigration into a country and they're dealing with issues there. There are probably all kinds of things that, that these guys know that, yeah, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by it. I'm no very impressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that, that both, you know, kind of all these themes are, are actually coming back to soft skills, you know, alignment of sort of interpersonal dynamics and being able to fit in and work with other people, uh, intercultural understanding. Um, you know, I was just talking with uh, with Ben and Alana, the, the Lumio crew over the lunch and realizing that actually, you know, the application itself in terms of the code is not the real magic. It's the philosophy underneath it that's really impressive. And I, th I think that's a pretty interesting frame um, that, that I had never really thought of. And, and t my technical bent coming here was like more like, oh, well, let's invest in technology, but it's actually investing in that culture as well and creating that culture through the technology. And, and looking at ways to apply that culture to problems throughout the world. 
that's that's another interesting thing to, to I mean, you could take a lead on that, or that's something that someone should look at. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we got about eight minutes left. I uh, want to open it up to conversation. More conversation. Hi, I'm Trevor. Um, futurists. I always thought science science fiction writers were fantastic futurists. And to be honest, you should look at them first. Yeah. And I'm still waiting for my um, my transporter. I want to be beamed up. I do want my holodeck. And I think virtual reality is really important going forward. I think the trends in virtual reality and the potential for holodeck type environments for training, for entertainment, for whatever you want is, is going to be phenomenal. And also in terms of... Um, changing your job or, you know, you, what you learn today, you won't know tomorrow. I trained as a geologist a long time ago. I'm all right now. I got better. Um, and I, I've left geology behind a, an awful long time ago. I think what I have picked up is connecting with people, talking to people, um, learning how to deal with different people. And in my work, I traveled all over the world to remote, remote parts of the world, jungles, deserts, of, you name it. Places where people don't normally go, Iraq, Iran, um, all over Africa, all over China, back in the 70s, um, before it opened up. So when I see China now, I'm just amazed by what they've done in the, in the 30 or 40 years since I first went there. So um, I think that, the, but in all my travels, and you talked about we look for the differences in people, the only way I could communicate, because I don't speak any other, I'm typically English, Apologies. I don't speak any other language. And so the only way I could communicate was with signs, gestures, uh, and finding what was common. And even in China, I can remember being in China in 1978 in one of the provinces, and I was with a group of Chinese, and there were some other foreigners there as well, and they chose me to share their train cabin with them. When I say train cabin, it was uh, minus 10 and there's no heating. So we all had all of our clothes on, all of us. And they chose me because they could get on with me. Not because I, I was any cleverer or anything else, but I found a way to communicate with them. And it's the connections and communications I think are really important. And so I actually, it kind of reflects what we're doing here and what you're trying to do here with this organization. It's just a comment. Thank you guys for sharing. And one piece I wanted to share in terms of being a futurist is I feel like technology is mimicking already our innate abilities. And I wouldn't be surprised if awareness winds up being the strongest currency of the future. So I would encourage everyone to develop the skills and practices to cultivate your awareness and I'm already seeing and people I'm interacting with people are becoming more psychic more lucid in their dreaming and so I don't I, so to me that is the the baseline and and um, that and the technology is mimicking that so I don't want to leave that out of the conversation and I so appreciated when you were mentioning the soft skills and then one other trend I'm seeing is it's you know, we had IQ as the strongest domain for a while. Now we all feel like we're really cutting edge with EQ and emotional intelligence. But as far as I'm concerned, what is really revolutionary is BQ, body intelligence, and grounding everything through embodiment. And, I've, and Amber and I have been calling it evolutionary primal. And so being really strong, healthy, and aware within our own bodies, um, I think is very important. And one last piece I'll throw in is, um, is as we define what being a futurist means for us, a great way to practice it is, I call it micro-futurism, where you make actions today that create a more um, thriving experience for yourself tomorrow. And that's, that's counterintuitive. So that might look like, okay, I'm, making, I'm taking the time to make myself green juice right now so that when I get home after a long day's work, my future self values is um, benefited from that, and I, that's a great way to practice the mic in the micro level mm. for longer term planning. Glad you brought up the awareness aspect, Ariel, because you know, in terms of this world, it, it keeps everything's moving faster and faster, especially in urban America. You know, it's kind of out here in Whiteman's Valley. It's, you don't feel the chaos as much. Um, but, but all of our worlds are accelerating uh, as part of things. And I think the need for mindfulness training, 
is more important than ever. Uh, I've had a practice of just, you know, eight to 10 minutes of silence in the morning each morning, and it's just done absolute wonders for my sanity. And I recommend that if you're called to any sort of mindfulness training, be it yoga, long distance running, meditation, whatever it is for you, um, taking that time for silence is really, really important as the world gets noisier and noisier. Yeah, the World Health Organization predicts that uh, over the next few decades, mental health is going to be the biggest health uh, challenge humanity is going to face. All right, so it's fascinating listening to this discourse. Um, I moved to New Zealand in 1982 uh, from the Bay Area. And one of the things that really attracted to me to New Zealand was the lack of class that is a very classless society in 1982. And also the same things that attract you about biculturalism were very attractive to me. But I've got some bad news to give you. Biculturalism may be in the speeches of our leaders, but if you look at, the, um, at all the demographic statistics for Maori, their life expectancy is about you know, 10 to 15 years shorter than for Pakeha, uh, income, is far, is far less prison population, 50% Maori, uh, despite being 15% of the population. So yes, the, the, the veneer, uh, the story is, is, is a really good one, and there is that commitment, and there is a partnership between Pakeha and Maori, but we have a really long way to go. And just looking around the room here, it's really interesting that we're mainly white and male. And so we really need to include uh, more of the people whose discourse we, we, we want to integrate into our own, into that conversation. Which kind of leads on to the trend of increasing inequality, mm -hmm. income inequality in particular. And in the time frame that I've lived in New Zealand between 1982 and 2015, we've gone from being one of the most equal societies in terms of, of income, in income distribution to one of the most unequal societies. So the real question for me is, how do we work as a group to address that issue? Uh, because if we don't address the issue, uh, then the issue will address us. It's all very easy for us to sit here and talk about it uh, when we're flying all over the Pacific and all over the world and spending money in a way that most other people could only dream of. Thanks for bringing that up, Dave. I, the inequality issue is something that uh, speaks to me very much and you know see that very clearly from where we come from in San Francisco and, and it's more stark than it is here so I think somewhat we sort of like wow like New Zealand's doing it better but obviously you know there's still a lot of problems and a lot of the challenges and during our kind of culture day a couple of days ago we we sort of had a chance to to understand uh, from different members of the community uh, what are those challenges and what what occurs to me is that um, this is very much a systems level problem. What I, what I think Eben sort of touches on and, and what speaks to me around the biculturalism in New Zealand is not that the systems are perfect, they seem far from it, but that there's an intentionality amongst pretty much everyone that I meet that's very much desiring for integrated, healthy, mutually respectful bicultural relationships and really intercultural, you know, multicultural. It's not just Pakeha Maori, but also the, the Chinese population, those crazy Americans, you know, there's a very open-minded cultural approach. Um, so, you know, I think the, these are problems that need to be solved everywhere. The, the rise of inequality, I think, s threatens the very underpinnings of our civil society worldwide. And it's gotten to extremes in America, and we see how this plays out in protest movements and you know disenfranchised populations and huge lost generations in Europe, uh, you know sixty percent unemployment in Greece. Um, these are very very real global challenges, and you know I think that for me I, I get animated to to say okay this is yet another area where New Zealand can lead, and I think that the the raw underpinnings are there of mutual respect and intentionality of the citizenry, but the systems are not yet working uh, to actually create that equitable, just uh, culture. So we need to work to, to translate that intention into action, right? Yeah. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna add something really quick to that. Yeah, oh, um, you know, I think about that a lot, and we're in this, it's gonna get worse. 
before it gets better, I think. And that's the, the inequality. And it's, it's fueled by technology as part of it. And then this unique position the U.S. is in right now as the single global power and the ability to print money. And so, you know, around 1970, they just started printing and printing, and it's caused this massive capital throughout the world, which goes, it, so you have the sort of waves of capitalism and expansion and uh, sort of commoditization of everything. And it, you can see what happens, you know, it, it, it's, it's causing the Gini coefficient to go up and up and up. And it's, I don't know what's going to disrupt that. It, that's the thing that I'm concerned about. You know, that's going to continue for a while. So I just want to echo your point that that's one of the biggest threats to, uh, to the future that we have. Yeah, that's a, that's a comment I wanted to make, Dave. I appreciate you brought it into the conversation. I mean, the, if we live in a world where there's accelerating technology and a belief that many share that, that that technology acceleration is adding leverage to the current systems that are causing massive inequality, massive environmental degradation, and so forth, um, and that the future is unknown, it's fairly unpredictable. It's like, Adam, you said, like, we don't know exactly how this is going to go because there's these thousand X types of movements and translations that are happening. I believe that the investment community is one of the key influencers in all of this because we get to help design those systems. We get to help choose what are the solutions. And so we can look at, okay, is this business creating job training for impoverished communities? Is this, is this business being run by leaders who have those development uh, of soft skills, who are thinking about diversity in the workplace, who are trying to take a structured business-like approach to solving some of these fundamental challenges and problems. Because what I see in Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of amazing investors, but there's, there's too much of a herd mentality, in my opinion, of how the venture capital community operates and just chases after what made money a few years ago. And what I really, I don't have the type of intimate familiarity with the New Zealand investor ecosystem, but what I really hope is that uh, because there's a little bit more silence here at the edge of the map, um, that there can be more of a forward looking approach and go, okay, if the world is changing so much over these next 10 years, what is that system design that we want to do for this country and for the globe that addresses these fundamental issues? Because so many people seem like they're helpless in this design, but those of us who have resources that we could deploy or at least influence uh, can make a really terrific impact on it. Doesn't that presuppose that you are the right people to be making those decisions? I mean, this is one You're of the. Well, uh, what if if you charitably give all your money away and allow a crowd of people to make the decision for you about where the money should be given? So you actually say, okay, look, if this is for the betterment of these people, why can't they decide how indeed it will better them rather than seeing the people who have collected the capital as the people who are in the best position to allocate that capital? Totally. I mean... Strong plus one, I think we're going to hear from Anna later, uh, crowd equity, crowdfunding, I think is hugely important. Uh, one of our missions is to increase the attention on philanthropy, because if people make a lot of money, like, do they really need to keep the money and just make more of it and invest it in for-profit structures, or can we give it away and take advantage of this opportunity in, in human history to actually deploy capital to change things? But that all being said, I want to recognize in presence the fact a lot of people are managing funds and they're managing you know, on behalf of LPs and, and they're stewards of capital and they need to earn a return. But because we're dealing with you know, criteria that often we only choose one, two, three out of 100 investments, we can be thoughtful and measured in our approach of what are the follow-on effects that this is having in the globe. At least that, that's my perspective. If I, uh, just talking to the investment, and you know, one, one of the opportunities that I think that probably or maybe is uniquely a New Zealand opportunity in terms of that investment space, and it doesn't matter whether it's unique or not, but it is around, it is around iwi, and, uh, and you know, the, 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 the iwi are becoming significant investors in New Zealand, and one of the things that's, uh, you know, that, and it talks to your point about herd mentality and stuff, that's not iwi. They're here for the long term, they're not going anywhere. And, and you know, as an investor, they're going to become increasingly important in, in shaping the New, New Zealand landscape. And, you know, one of the opportunities I think you guys, uh, you know, you guys are looking at New Zealand and, and, and uh, as a unique opportunity, and I think relationships with iwi in an investment sense is one of those is one of the places to be looking really because uh, 
They have uh, increasing, uh, increasing wealth, increasing capability. Uh, they have a long-term view in terms of being here and they're about New Zealand, uh, to state the obvious. So, uh, you know, I, th I think that's one of the places. You know, one of the other conversations that's going on, I know, sort of in that investment framework uh, sort of space is, is between um, is between iwi and Chinese and and uh, with and with regard to land and um, you know because there's an alignment in terms of time frames uh, there's an alignment in terms of not requiring short-term financial returns um, and there's an alignment in terms of believing in the in, in the in the long-term value of land and so you know, I, I mentioned that as sort of one of the other sort of pieces that I think will shape the landscape. But I think, you know, you, you guys, are, 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 I welcome it. You look at the opportunity in New Zealand and stuff, and I really think that's, you know, if you're talking about investment landscapes, that's one of them. And then if I can use my time to ask a question, Joseph, which is, you know, you, 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 you talked, um, uh, it, I think it is just about, you know, news, the culture providing an op a different way to look at, at problems and, and to look at opportunities offshore. And I was just interested, I guess, as a New Zealander to, see, to hear what you see as, you know, what, you, what you're thinking about in terms of that, what you see, what, what, what's your, what was behind that statement. So, yeah, I was thinking about this idea of that um, any number of the experiments that we're doing today in, in our approach to these problems um, could pay a thousand x return, and in terms of the way that it the way that it's implemented in the in the, in the future, we just don't know yet. And so, um, uh, the way that the way that things are done here, I think this goes back to what you had brought up the the way that the two cultures work together is a it's a unique it's a unique ex experiment almost. In human history, and it's it's happening right here. It's it's evolving right here, and that mindset could be applied to problems throughout the world. Um, and I, as a scientist, I'd, I want, I'd love, love to see what what would happen, you know, because one of those might, you know, if 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 that's if it's true that we're at a moment in history where thinking of the world as an island is like what we need to do today, and not in a hundred years or not in a thousand years, then we'll find out really fast if it if it's if it's going to work. Or maybe it's maybe it's actually a thousand years from now when it works. I don't know, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, one more comment here. <clears throat> There's a lot of conversation going around about things like um, income inequality, um, inequality between men and women in the workplace, these kinds of things. And I think we, when you start studying systems and um, big complex systems, you start realizing that to fix something that you don't go to work on the thing, you go to work upstream several steps in the system to, in order to do this, and that systems tend to be very resilient and they push back, and there are all of these side effects, and we have to be careful, you know? We don't wanna do what uh, Deming called tampering and mess it up. But that said, um, I think we have to look at the, like almost the other perspective, we have to invert it a little bit and ask, start asking questions like, how do we keep parents together raising their children? And how do we get dads at home more raising their children? And how do we raise humans that are more integrated, less fragmented human beings that don't go and do all these things in the first place? You know? And so, you know, here it seems like there's a lot more ecological thinking because somehow in this place, even the folks that are you know, more in the, I don't know, stereotypically disconnected worlds of investment and technology and so forth, they're still more connected to the land here than they are in most places that I've seen, especially where I come from in America. Um, so that ecological thinking seems more intuitive here. Um, so I, I suspect that there are a lot of things culturally here that could be studied a little bit closer um, and looked at and then taken and brought to the rest of the world that are really great resources, you know? Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if there is a place where you've got very high um, levels of, of, of parents staying together, like other places in the world and taking, like that, taking knowledge from that part of the world, taking knowledge around the ecological um, appreciation that's here and studying that. Somebody, if somebody could round that up um, and look at those places throughout the world, that would be interesting. 
Yeah. Um, we're approaching lunch. Uh, there are a couple of people who have been raising their hands, uh, so I'd love to give them an opportunity. But before I do so, uh, we've talked a little bit about land, and uh, we're in a primarily farming uh, nation. Uh, I'm curious to hear what are you, some of your thoughts on the future of food and how we should think about farming and, and our relation to that and any trends that you see. I think it's a critically, critically important question to be asking of, of how do we think about our, our food systems as they relate to our integration with the natural ecosphere. Um, there's, you know, there's been a lot of stats, and we talked about this on Saturday, you know, the populations are rising, there's no new arable land coming online. In fact, topsoil is degrading at a very rapid rate, making less and less land available to feed more and more people. Uh, I think it's really complex uh, and um, very much a system. Food is all interrelated. You can't really think about food unless you're also thinking about water and can't think about that unless you're thinking about energy. Can't think about energy without thinking about the whole economy and our whole frame and paradigm for doing things. So food goes all the way to the bottom. It's, it's like the root physicality that our entire civilization is built upon and nothing works without food. And so I think that over the next 10 years in terms of themes, I, I think that agriculture, um, the food as well as medicine, I, I think these are two things that aren't commonly linked, but we need to be thinking about our food system and our health system as one. And, uh, you know, I think the convergence of, of climate change and, and these ecological pressures uh, create a problem, but I also think that there are new systems coming online through technologies, uh, both ancient and modern. So, you know, ancient technology like permaculture and biomimicry, modern technology like robotics and sensor technologies um, present an oppor a tremendous opportunity in New Zealand, both for the application of these systems, just simply using the best practices could prevent, present a substantial improvement in the yield for New Zealand farm and agricultural exports, and simultaneously uh, the development of new technologies, because this is not an area, and, and I can sort of highlight this for from Silicon Valley perspective, there is very little awareness of the agricultural sector in the traditional technology hotspots. And one key advantage that I think New Zealand has is a highly educated, world-class forward-thinking population that is embedded in an agricultural economy. And so they understand the problems that are faced. The farmers aren't six hours drive away. And, you know, so there's an ability to, to really get things going here. Um, and I think that it's, it's a huge global problem. And, and it's going to be something that's getting a lot, lot more attention in the next couple of years as food security becomes a much bigger issue. Um, healthcare crisis that we face in the U.S. is really rising awareness of this. Food, right? We, I like definitions. Um, if you look at most of the things that people put into their mouths and swallow, they would be almost better described as semi-edible food-like <laughs> substances. And that's most of what people eat, where I come from anyway. Um, and so I think it, you know, the question is, why are people putting that in their mouths and in their bodies? And you could say, well, because it tastes good. Well, that's, that's true. Um, but I think that there's, there's something deeper there. Um, I think that people use food to make themselves feel better and that the more meaninglessness that humans experience and the more kind of disenfranchisement and the more just disconnected they feel from ha you know, having meaning and having purpose and having connection to other people, the more they need to find a way to fill that hole inside of them. And some people use drugs and some people use pornography and some people use semi-edible food-like substances. Um, but getting to the heart of what we mean by food and you know, I think I think technology is going to really help out um, in this one because I think that when we can make food that it tastes the way that we like things to taste, but has the nutrients in there as well, um, I think that that I think that's going to be a big one for uh, for humans, and it can be made of nu nutrition rather than what's in that stuff. 
Slight topic change. Um, Adam mentioned that central governments have a license to print money and that's causing equality issues. And I think while we're talking about future trends, technology and investment, it seems remiss not to discuss digital currencies such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin and the blockchain technology and what that might, opportunities that that might create. And being borderless, I can see there's huge potential in New Zealand for that. However, I feel like I'm the only person I often interact with that wants to talk about that. So I'm really interested in your understanding of what the opportunities might be for New Zealand, what you're seeing in the US around the investment community's appetite for either investing in digital currency businesses or transacting with digital currencies, anything in that space would be really interesting. Do you have anything? I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know a lot about it. Um, I, I think investing in those, uh, in the companies, I think, I think people have been holding back from investing heavily in it, but I think that it's kind of a bottom up um, bootstrapping type business and a lot of them have gotten have, they've gone really far on their own uh, but a lot of companies are now offering um, you know you can get your expenses done in Bitcoin now uh, I mean we Expensify does that and I mean so uh, anecdotally I think that people are using that as a form of payment and that's becoming more common that's for sure but I'm not an expert on this stuff at all Matthew knows a lot more about Bitcoin than I do so I want to yeah. I I would love to just comment. It's, it's, it's something I'm, I'm growing more passionate about. I, I guess just a couple quick observations. One would be, you know, Mark Andreessen, who who started Netscape. You know, he's calling this the most important uh, invention. You know, essentially since we started the internet. And um, and there are a lot of really, really, really smart people in Silicon Valley who think this is revolutionary in so many ways that have yet to be fully grokked. So I think takeaway one is like we need to all learn more about it. It's, it's so complex and it's so big that we need to give it the appropriate spaciousness and, and I'm really glad to hear you bring it up. Um, you know, I think there's an important distinction between Bitcoin and blockchain technology. And so, you know, as we tease apart these conversations, that will be something that becomes more important. Um, it, but I also just want to make an observation that because a lot of this stuff is network effect based, New Zealand has this really interesting opportunity to be first in a lot of things because the networks are so tight and so you can actually spread things through a network here much, much faster than in Silicon Valley uh, being in the United States market. Um, so I think that the startups that uh, figure things out here could actually create the solutions and export that IP globally and build them from a global perspective from the beginning, but get it right in New Zealand first. And it could be a huge one of those thousand X types of opportunities for New Zealand investors and entrepreneurs uh, to focus on. So. Um, you know, it's a sensitive topic when you get to the currency side of things, and I, you know, I think it just needs to be a lot of education and, and discussion about it. I'm by no means an expert, but it's something that we're we're definitely paying attention to and trying to develop points of view around. Yeah, when when we first came here, uh, one of the things I was really impressed by was the sophistication of the financial infrastructure. You know, there's still check writing and stuff in in the states, and like you come here and it's like what's a check, you know, like, it seems arcane, um, you know, and that speaks to that sort of smaller, tighter community. Um, there's also, you know, and folks I've talked to, um, jurisdictions and, and sort of legal um, regulatory issues that are really unclear. And I think that um, that's good in a way, like, I, I don't know enough about Bitcoin to know whether to know how good it is or not good it is. Um, but it's again, uh, this thing that comes back to the ability for New Zealand to um, be forward leading through leveraging its superior civic society. It's okay, can we have a very thoughtful conversation with government about Bitcoin and come to some sort of smart regulation that gives businesses the confidence to build in a certain jurisdiction? And because like you said, it's global, like I've met, when we were at South by Southwest last year, met several Bitcoin entrepreneurs who were like, ooh, New Zealand, do you think they'd let me do my startup there? And I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but it, you know, it's just sort of a, it, it just definitely shows the opportunity. And, and you know, when a lot of people we've talked to are trying to recruit entrepreneurs here, and, and that is a fast growing, potentially extremely important industry. I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah, I'm not an expert on this, uh, this one, but I'm watching it with a lot of uh, curiosity and anticipation. Um, but just to bring a little bit of history, you know, money has gone through a few major evolutions, right? So several thousand years ago, it was what they called commodity money. So it'd be things like salt or barley, where if something went wrong and you couldn't spend it, you could always eat it, 
you know, and then it went to representative money where it'd be things like gold and silver, and that was maybe a couple of thousand years ago, and then a couple few hundred years ago, the banks figured out that you could get people to bring their gold in and leave with a piece of paper. And they said, you know, the light bulb went on. <laughs> um, and I, I was talking to Matthew, I don't know, last year or something, and he said, you know, we're going to look back on right now and we're going to say, you remember when, we, you know, we were around when Bitcoin started. And that was a, somehow, that just hasn't left me. I think about that one regularly. Um, yeah, it's going to be a big deal. I, I don't know how, but it's going to be, it's another, it's like, another one of those, you know, it's like when reptiles turned into mammals or something like <laughs> some, something's going on here that is, we should all be paying attention to it. Yeah, just, just an observation and uh, Bill and Dave, uh, I think we've got to take seriously in New Zealand this question of inequality. It's real and, and for us to move away from this gathering here over the last five days and say, hey, New Zealand's a great country, we need to lead, we have the opportunity to be our first. But inequality ac actually exists in here. And the latest census of 2013 has just come out. And while there's been significant improvement in the statistics for Māori, you start from a low base, there's always going to be improvement. And, and things need to change. And we, we make no, no apology. And, and as Bill's pointed out, there's new leadership um, being exemplified there. The treaty settlements process has been successful and we're reinvesting a lot of our own and put the emphasis on own money back into it where a lot of the responsibility actually still relies back on government to provide an education system that's inclusive for all. Uh, I'm actually, our unemployment rate is, is double the rate of, um, of, of the general New Zealand population. Yeah, I actually don't think that a solo mum with three or four kids takes any pride in knowing that their children or their husband is not at work. They love them to be at work. But it doesn't happen because we have inter intergenerational unemployment that actually occurs. But our presentation from Tour Rawpaki emphasises the positive. We, we, we go out and paint a positive picture of what is trying to, to happen that we are protective of our environment. And the, those who were here on Saturday saw the geothermal exercises. What you take, you put back down on the ground, so in five years later, it comes back. Our farming practice is all basically an integrated model, is that what you take from, from the land, you give back to the land. If you don't look after the whenua, our people say, the whenua will not look after you. So we need to look after it to ensure that for the future, it looks after us. And I, I think the issue that you brought up about, uh, Matthew, about the, uh, we've got to move past the intentionality. The intention is good. Yeah, we, we have a free and open government in New Zealand, which yeah, people like me are extremely proud of. But I think we, we, we actually still, still need, to, need to do more. Yeah, activities like, like NEXT and Calorie Institute and what they're doing, Conservation and environment, wonderful. No issue with that. But I do have an issue is when you're talking about the land, but we have a saying in Māori, ke fe to be nunui, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is the most important thing? It is people, it is people, it is people. Now, if it's people, how come conservation and the environment is more important than people? How come these other activities are more important than our people suffering from inequality and generational unemployment? You can find for the conservation side of it, environment, which also a key part of our being. We measure our mountains and our rivers as our spiritual guidance. But then it is still about people. How then can that sort of funding go into our people? And you made the point. There's got to be somewhere along all the Silicon Valley in, um, Investment, same as investment back in New Zealand. Where is that five or ten percent that is going, going to be focused on? How do we actually address this inequality that is with, with us? And just leave you with a quote. It's an American too, George Bateman. The source of our problem is the difference between the way humans think and the way nature works. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And what, what majority of people around here are all systems people, while well, George Bateman was the father of, of systems. Well, I think it's just a reflection, as we've said. And once again, thank you very much for this conference. I'm leaving this afternoon, but it's been great. The diversity and, and the discussion and the ability for everybody to get up and have a say. Kia ora mō tātou. Just, I'd like to mention John, I don't know how many of you have met him. He leads the Future of Food Project with the Tarapaki Trust, which is the most successful iwi-run farm uh, in New Zealand, located in Taupo. Um, I know Nick Garrison had, he's been wanting to ask a question, making a comment. You get the last one. Thank you. Um, my one really is a story about my own personal experience of the future. Um, I've been focused and dedicated on New Zealand innovation for the last decade and a half. You know, going out and work, walking up Sandhill Road, etc. And one of the most profound things actually happened to me in the last year back in my own country, where through a course of events I've become co-director and co-producer of a documentary that we're doing about the Tuhoi settlement, which um, I'll be happy to talk to you about um, later. And the, the documentary is based on a, on a two and a half hour interview between me and Tamadi Kruger, who's led the settlement negotiations. And I've learnt so much about the future because you know what? It's not going to be delivered to us in 10 years' time. We will all walk out that door after this session into the future. And I think that part of the frame that we're missing is the fact actually the future's there right now and it's actually up to us to build it. Now, some of the opportunity that has um, you know, emanated through the treaty settlement process that we've heard in New Zealand has created one of a point of inflection which doesn't exist in any other um, Western country really in the world at the moment. And in the Tuhoi case, basically that whole culture was almost driven into non-existence and shelved for 150 years. And I'll just finish with an anecdote because one of the comments that Tamadi said to me, and I felt very privileged to be the recipient of this comment, he said, just imagine if we hadn't waited 150 years, just imagine what Tuhoi could have done with technology to create the future. Mm -hmm. So in this frame, humanity, our existence, it's actually we are part of the biodiversity, just like a bee, just like a butterfly. Mm. So it's actually about a reframe of sovereignty. Mm. And it's actually about us being sovereign and providing the leadership. And my challenge to all of us here is when we work, walk through that door after the session, we're walking into the future. So I don't want to actually wait 10 years. The solutions are there. We've got the leadership in the room there, you know, right here, right now. It's more a question of actually starting to do it. And doing it in a respectful sense where we are part of the biodiversity and that we acknowledge tangata whenua. So my story and my experience has actually been one of discovering the future by going back to the past within my own culture.